Thank you. Hey. <laughs> okay. So, so we should ask at least one deep philosophical question per week, and it's already Friday. Let me take care of that. What is life? <laughs> Uh, not, not in a, an existential sense, like more scientific. What is it that makes you say this thing is live and this thing is not? This is just to trigger you a little bit. It's, uh, it's, something, uh, it's a question I will avoid more elegantly later on. I will just leave it dangling for now. <laughs> I will talk about a specific weird kind of life, which is a life, artificial life. Look at this thing. It's like a, a stick figure, okay? A little creature um, looks like maybe an insect or a, some weird kind of bacterium. This is generated randomly. Actually, the creature itself is not directly generated. What I did was generate a genome, a genotype, randomly numbers, and then there is an algorithm that goes from the genotype to this phenotype, the body of the creature. Let me talk about this algorithm like embryology, right, uh, going from genotype to phenotype. What I do is just come up with numbers, bytes, a few of them. Hmm? And then I cluster the numbers into uh, bunches of 14 bytes that are called, uh, well, uh, call them chromosomes or whatever, uh, you know, uh, uh, meets your fancy. And uh, at this point, uh, I have, in this case, just four chromosomes. Actually, usually I generate more, but I want to keep the creatures simple for this example. Now, each chromosome kind of maps over a segment of the creature. <laughs> and the genes in the chromosome define how that segment looks. So, for example, there is a gene here that says uh, uh, how long the segment is going to be. So, the first one is going to be pretty short. The third one is going to be relatively longer. So, there. And there is another one that says how thick the segment is going to be. And there it is, thickness. And then there is uh, a triplet of three genes that are defining the colors of the segment. There. And so on and so forth. You, you got the idea. I will not explain every single gene, but there is one that is particularly important. The first gene is essentially in encoding, uh, say, instructions of a very simple programming language. OK, this is about uh, the angle of the segment. And then this simple programming language for assembling the body. OK? So the algorithm goes through it, and it assembles the body according to this super simple language. So now we have a body. We can add uh, eyes for you know, cosmetic touches and the mouth. And there, you have a creature. Okay. So this is the example. I actually can come up with something better, probably, by generating a few randomly. It takes some time. It's in Java. <laughs> so here, some of them are super small and simple. This one it probably has a stop instruction first in the first segment in the head. But other ones can be more complex. This one has a lot of mirroring, and then you can go on and on and on. You could generate bodies for your entire life, actually, or, or the life of a few universes. If you do the math, yeah, there are a lot of numbers there. So you can have a lot of bodies, OK? So there is one more thing that I want to tell you about bodies. There is this interesting quality of bodies that uh, if you have two genotypes that are similar, you will probably generate similar bodies. You can probably say that the first two creatures are kind of similar. The third one is quite different. It has a very different genotype. So similar genotypes, similar phenotypes. Different genotypes, different phenotypes. OK. Now we have a creature. Let's make it move. How can a creature such as this one move? Well, uh, one way to make it move is to have a little generator in the head that is essentially generating a sine wave. And the sine wave has a frequency. And the frequency is determined by the genes in the creature. Actually, it doesn't need to be so symmetrical. It can be two separate frequencies for the positive side and the negative side, different genes, uh, so that it can go slow in one direction and then fast in the other direction. It's fine. Then the body of this creature is it's a tree, right? 
And just like the segments are connected in a tree, in each segment, I coded a small nerve that is connected in a tree with all the nerves in the body. So there is this nervous system in the creature. And each nerve is taking the input from its parent and propagating it to its children. But crucially, it's not doing that instantaneously. There is a delay determined by the genes. So imagine what happens. The head is generating values along this curve, right? And the curve is, the values are spreading down the body of the creature with some delay. So it's as if this wave is kind of moving through the body of the creature. And when the wave hits a segment of the body of the creature, the segment reacts by changing its angle around its rest angle with some amplitude that is genetically determined. Okay. So let's see what happens. There. Uh, let me activate the wave in the head. There, now it's moving. Yeah, it's cute. Okay, it cr basically crashed the screen. I don't know how it made it. I, they were not supposed to be that smart. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, here it is. Here it is back. Okay, uh, it's moving, but uh, if you look closely, uh, it's not really moving. It, this il illusion of movement is just the viewport trying to stay centered on the creature, because if you look at these speckles that I put in for reference, you will see that they don't move relative to the head. So this creature is just changing its own shape, but it's not actually swimming. You know? To make it swim, I had to write my own, uh, honestly, half fast, uh, very buggy, physics engine, and uh, look at the way that the creature is moving and uh, uh, calculating uh, all the rotations and the translations that would follow if the creature were actually moving like that. And when you reapply these rotations and translations to the creature, then it will actually swim. Let me do that. There, now it's swimming properly. It sucks <laughs> at swimming. Okay, it's a, it's a random creature. I mean, it's not supposed to be a great swimmer, but it does kind of move, and uh, it, it just doesn't have a direction. Uh, it moves randomly somewhere. It's drifting, it seems to be very slowly drifting in the opposite direction to its mouth. There is one more thing. These are basically reactive robots. They take a single input and they move uh, consequentially. And this single input is the direction of their mouth. So by default, the mouth is pointing straight to the right, but if I turn the mouth, the creature will move differently. It will just add a bunch of uh, skewing factors to the segment of its body that are determined by the genes. How does it move differently exactly? What does that mean? Nothing in particular, it's just moving differently. This might result in moving in a different direction or not. It might result in moving in the right direction or not. It's brainless. It doesn't think. It doesn't understand what it's doing. It's, it just, you know, oscillates. Okay, good. Now, oh, wow, it's dead again. Yeah. Now, what happens if I take a lot of these creatures and I put them together on a big dish and I put maybe food on the dish, and I let them go. Let me do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm creating a dish and generating a bunch of random DNA strains. And I'm putting these DNA strains into these little eggs here. You see? Egg. OK? The eggs will hatch in a short while. Here, you can also see food around. It's these small red speckles here, okay? Let me make this larger so we can see clearly what is happening. And uh, in a short while, I expect that we will start seeing tiny little creatures, so cute. Okay, this one doesn't have much of a body at all. It's just two eyes and a mouth. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> it, it's probably not going anywhere. But other <laughs> creatures, like this one, for example, whoo, look at this, yay. Uh, not the most elegant ever, and it's uh, going in a completely wrong direction. What it's doing, it, 
it's just looking at the food around it, uh, itself and uh, trying to find food close by, get in that direction, then it moves consequentially. Again, does that mean it moves towards the food? No. <laughs> it just moves. And uh, then it's changing direction with the changing direction of the food and so on and so on. Now, these creatures also have um, some kind of uh, uh, energy of sorts. Uh, so if they consume all their energy by being just too big, for example, by having too much body segments, by moving too fast without like this thing, without making good use of them, uh, in that case, they will probably eventually die. Every now and then you see one getting more transparent and dying. But on the other end, the ones that are just a tiny little bit better will eventually reach food. And when they do, they can choose to reproduce by creating an egg and putting some energy into it. How much energy? Genetically determined. And, uh, and they are putting inside the egg, together with the energy, a copy of their own DNA. Here's the twist. The copy is not perfect. There might be slight mistakes in copying the DNA over, OK? So you probably understand where I'm going with this thing. But let me look at the recipe. The recipe is we got phenotypic variation, which means different genotypes, different phenotypes, similar genotypes, similar phenotypes. We generate a few of these. The second ingredient in the recipe is selection. Some of these phenotypes happen to be just more lucky in a way, just a tiny little bit better at reaching food. They have higher chances of survival, maybe marginally so, but they do. And then you have mutation. So when reproduction happens, you might get children that are just a little bit better or just a little bit worse than their parents at reaching food because phenotypic variation. And then selection, and then mutation again, and the cycles go on. And guess what you get? So how does evolution work here? What does it look like? If you look at an experiment, for example, you take, instead of generating them randomly, you take a few of these, OK? And you generate a few of these. And you put them on a dish. And then you let them go. And what you get after a while is some kind of genealogical tree, like these. Essentially, every segment here is a generation. And as you can see, most creatures never get very far. They never reproduce. Or maybe they reproduce for a generation or two because food keeps spawning. After a while, you just get lucky. You know you get a snippet of food spawning straight in your mouth. But uh, yeah, that kind of luck doesn't hold for long. So after a while, they get extinct. <coughs> a few of them, however, get lucky. They get a good mutation, maybe. They start generating descendants. And some of them eventually take over the entire dish. Now, if you look at this, uh, there is a good chance that the creatures at the uh, right edge of the screen are still alive. Because the creatures at the left edge are probably dead because old age. Or, uh, so one thing that you can do is to look at the entire dish. Look at the DNA in the entire dish and select the DNA that has the minimum distance from all the other DNAs in the dish. This is something that in biology is called the Levenstein distance. And this DNA is essentially the DNA of the most representative, successful creature, right? Let's say it's that one. And once you find that one, you can walk the tree backwards. Because there is no sexual reproduction here, so each creature only has one parent. So you can always walk backwards up to the original ancestor. And now you have an evolutionary path that goes from not evolved at all to quite evolved. And we can look at it, actually. So what happens now? If I start the demo with the uh, previous stick creature, the small one, and then I let it run for the equivalent of about one month of real time, which uh, is actually more like one night because, of course, I make it run super fast without graphics and with all the optimizations that I could code in. Uh, after 4,000 and so on generations, you get something like this. It doesn't look at all 
like its original ancestor. But look at the way it moves. It's actually quite interesting. It has two organs. One organ is pushing it through the palm. And the other organ is there just to counterbalance the first organ so that essentially it avoids uh, excessive rotations that would set it off track. So it stays on track. It goes straight right towards the direction where the mite is po uh, mouth is pointing. And if I turn the mouth around, there it is. It turns. It's quite effective to be such a simple creature. It's limited by the number of chromosomes it has, but it's quite good. How the heck did we get from here to here? We can look at this. The first thing that happens is a second generation where the creature just mutates a lot. There is a reshaping of the body because the first body is just too bad. It doesn't, uh, it, it, it barely ever reaches food. It did once, it was just blind luck. This one is not much better, to be honest. It rotates around a lot. It's uh, uh, very unstable. But the important part is that it's moving a little bit more, which makes it slightly more likely that it will just stumble upon a piece of food. And if you keep it going, and you keep it going, you will see that the creature is mutating. The head that is essentially serving no purpose except uh, a waste of energy is uh, removed altogether. The body keeps getting thinner, especially in the parts of the body that are not pushing the creature through the dish, like its legs, while the feet that are actually pushing the creature through the dish get fatter and bigger. And it goes on and on across hundreds and hundreds of generations. And if you look at the difference between one single creature and its descendant, you might not see a difference. You might see a difference that looks backwards. It looks like a negative mutation. But overall, in the course of many, many generations, they add up. And you get a creature that is more and more stable, better and better at swimming. Let me go a little bit faster. At some point, uh, you keep seeing how the creature gets thinner and thinner and longer and longer. There is always this other organ that is stabilizing it. And at some point around, I think, 2,600 generations, I believe, there is a key mutation. And here it is. The creature loses one leg. And now, evolution is on another path, a completely different path, because now this shape is not ideal anymore because uh, you probably need a slightly more compact shape to be more stable and go towards the food. And this is what keeps happening. It keeps getting shorter now. It gets slightly fatter. It's uh, a new evolutionary path. This is path dependency in action. And finally, you get this thing, which is the thing where I stop the experiment but it's still evolving. It might become something else already. So, uh, OK, we've seen evolution. We've seen how it happens. And uh, here are a few of the creatures that I found on my dish. But I usually let it run overnight, and I look at it in the morning. There are these tiny sperm-like creatures that are not particularly interesting. They're super slow, but they're very good at rotating. So you will see that once somebody eats their food, they start rotating, and they do that very, very fast. One creature that, uh, frankly, almost made me fall off my chair when I looked at it, uh, I really wasn't expecting this to happen. It's this beauty. It's two of them. Look at it. It's incredible. I will slow it down so you can look actually how incredibly synchronized their bodies are. The way that they close, they fold in their arms when they are pushing out, and then they unfold their arms to push themselves forward. It's just designed. You know what I mean? It's complex. Complex in the sense that if I take off any organ, if I change the ratio between the way, for example, they fold and unfold their arms, and the way they um, open and close their arms, they will just fail. It's quite an amazing sight. But usually, if you leave it running for a very long time, what you get is almost always something like this. Look at it. It's a monster. It's really huge. Look how small its mouth is by comparison. It's just very, very thin and long with these long legs and these feet right at the end that become fatter because they need, it needs that push. And another thing that totally surprised me, I was expecting that they would learn to rotate. But instead, what happened is that 
when you point their mouth south, as in this case, they just walk sideways. I don't know why. It's probably <laughs> just easier to do that than rotating a symmetrical body. I have no idea, but matter of fact, this is what usually happens. I'm not uh, able right now to evolve creatures that are much more interesting than these because, well, the system is simple and nature doesn't like complexity for complexity's sake. So I need a system that is more complex to evolve more complex creatures. So don't expect them to take over the world anytime soon. <laughs> but this uh, kind of takes me back to my original question, right? Uh, actually, let me rephrase the question about life. This program that I coded, is it a simulation of life or an instance of it? I mean, are these things alive? Now, most of you probably think that I lost my marbles for good. Of course, they're not alive. They are algorithms, all right? They are computer programs. But the problem with that is that we don't really know what life is. It's surprising, but if you look at science, even biology, that is only concerned with life, and you look at the definition of life, it's not really a tight definition, it's more like a checklist. Yeah, it's alive if it has all of these, you know? Uh, it's uh, complex and uh, it uh, it's self-reproduces and so on and so on. But the problem is that you can find counterexamples both ways. You can find things that are clearly not alive and have most of the qualities of life, and you can find things that are alive and lack some of the qualities in the checklist. So essentially, this is more like a Douglas Adams question. We don't understand the question, how can we expect to come up with a good answer, right? So I would uh, just avoid the question altogether. What I can say is that uh, they have some of the qualities of life, and one of them is that they would do anything to survive which means that they will exploit their environment in any possible way to become more fit to the environment and survive. And because their environment is made of code, they exploit my bugs all the time. Every time I have a bug in my physics engine, I notice because they debug, debug it for me. They just evolve in ways that I wasn't expecting by using my bugs. For example, I, I have so many examples, but I don't have much time. One that really drove me crazy was in the beginning when I had um, a problem in my physics engine. I wasn't taking into account moments of inertia. So essentially what happened is that, um, well, if you are in the liquid and you move, uh, you are suspended in water and you move your hands, your hands will move a lot and your body will move just a little, right? Moment of inertia. But in this case, that wasn't happening, so they could develop huge tails and move the tails and tiny little heads and move their tails around crazily and rotate and propel themselves forward. And what I uh, found is that in every single experiment, after just a few minutes, I got something like this. Uh, I call them swarmers. Look at them. They move towards food in huge swarms. They are so simple so they barely consume any energy at all, right? <laughs> so, look, uh, they, these, are their, these are their creatures, they are doomed. Uh, look at this piece of food, okay? They just uh, swore through, they, are, uh, they have no precision whatsoever, they just miss food all the time. But there are so many of them. So they take over the pond and drive everybody else to extinction. Look at those buggers. <laughs> I had to rewrite the entire physics engine to get rid of them. So I, this is actually touching in some weird way. It's like, whoa, seriously? It's a, um, there is a, a quote that is almost uh, obvious here from a famous, if fictional, <laughs> scientist, right? <laughs> they find a way. <laughs> so this is the same process, after all, that creates uh, mold and penguins and uh, trees and people. Hmm? Then some of the byproducts of this uh, process actually look back at something like this. They find it extremely useful and for understanding. And 
quite beautiful, actually. I find this so beautiful. This is the most beautiful thing I ever did with coding. I've been coding for 30 years because I didn't really build it. It, it kind of builds itself. It's quite amazing. I guess this is the story of how I got um, emotionally attached to stick figures. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, people. This is the project. Uh, I, I'm looking for a new name. Uh, there is a file in the root with name ideas. If you have a name that is not uh, kind of unique and obvious, uh, just pull request, you know. And uh, if you are interested, read the credits, because so much of this I lifted from other people's work. So I, it's only fair that I give back like that. Buy this book. This is completely unrelated. I hear it. <laughs> it's good. Thanks.